Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Robert Pennock. He is a university distinguished professor at Michigan State University, where he is on the faculty of Lyman Briggs College, the departments of philosophy and computer science and engineering, and the ecology, evolution, and behavior program. His research involves empirical and philosophical questions that relate to evolutionary biology, cognitive science, and the scientific character, such as the evolution of altruism, complexity, and intelligence. He is the author of books like An Instinct for Truth, Curiosity, and the Moral Character of Science, which we're going, which we're going to focus on today. So, Dr. Pennock, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you, Ricardo. It's a pleasure to be here. So, um, what are scientists characterized for? I mean, do they have any special psychological traits? So, so I come to this obviously as a philosopher of science and, and you know, we typically focus on scientific theories. We talk about their concepts, that's, that's our bread and butter. Uh, but I also do scientific research myself in collaboration with scientists. Uh, and so my interest uh, is really in the relationship of scientific theory and their methods and uh, concepts to their mindset. Uh, and uh, really, I, I like to, to characterize this in terms of the aims of their practice. Uh, I, I think of this as um, science having a vocational telos, really a, a, a central guiding purpose that governs what we do and what we ought to do. Uh, and for scientists, I think that's just characterized by the vocational focus of trying to discover truths about the causal structure of the world. That's the basic things that uh, that characterizes them. And I think what what they think about uh, is really guided uh, and ought to be guided by uh, by that goal. Mm -hmm. We will get into some perhaps psychological traits that are important for a scientist to have, I guess. But first of all, since you're interested in understanding intelligence from an evolutionary perspective, is there anything from that literature that you also apply to science, the scientific method or scientific thinking more generally? Yeah, so I guess philosophers have explored what it means to have knowledge. Uh, really in great detail. I mean, that's what epistemologists uh, do. And, and typically we do it from our armchairs. Uh, uh, I think we've made a lot of uh, progress conceptually in thinking about that. Um, but I think we can go farther now uh, and start to investigate this using um, digital uh, evolutionary models so that we can start to do this empirically. Uh, it really is I think a revolutionary way to start to consider some of these epistemological questions. Uh, I kind of think of it as being experimental epistemology. And I'm particularly interested in how uh, organisms could evolve to become knowers in the first place. And most of the way we've analyzed this is thinking about what we know and how we know now uh, and working sort of backwards, a top-down notion. Um, but I guess my general thesis on this is that uh, uh, Athena didn't leap fully formed from the head of Zeus. Uh, uh, we ought to think about how it is uh, that knowledge uh, uh, kind of evolved and how we could have evolved to be knowers. And obviously it didn't just happen uh, all at once. And that's the evolutionary perspective. Now, philosophers have used kind of an evolutionary analogy in the past Popper certainly talked about uh, the way in which one tests scientific hypotheses as being an evolutionary process. You know, you put forward a bold hypothesis, uh, you look for uh, evidence that might um, disprove it and so on. And the idea was that it's kind of a selection process uh, uh, of the weeding out of, uh, of false hypotheses in that way. Um, Quine uh, talked about uh, 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 knowledge in a very similar kind of way that in the end you would appeal to uh, evolution uh, to weed out uh, those that that were not successful at, at at knowing so philosophers have have done this in the past and i think that's a fruitful kind of analogy but i think we're actually at a point now where we're able to do this uh, in a very 
uh, direct uh, experimental way. Uh, digital evolution lets us implement essentially the evolutionary mechanism uh, in a computer system. Uh, and that allows us then to set up environments and test the conditions under which uh, the components of knowledge, the, the building blocks that could have slowly built up to allow us to become knowers uh, can now be investigated in a, in a pretty direct way. Uh, and to me, this is kind of the, uh, the revolutionary position that we're in now. We can take epistemology further by able to essentially test some of these philosophical ideas. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there are some innate psychological proclivities that lead us towards science or predispose us to scientific thinking or is it uh, an intellectual enterprise that is, too, is usually too detached from our intuitive, intuitive thinking? So, I mean, I, I titled uh, my book an, an Instinct for Truth uh, and really I, I used that it, a part of a quote from Charles Darwin, uh, where he was writing uh, uh, in a letter to someone just reflecting upon his own scientific uh, way of thinking. And he says, you know, that he felt within himself an instinct for truth or knowledge or discovery uh, that's of the same uh, kind as the instinct for virtue. Um, and uh, so I think there's a there's a biological basis um, to this disposition that we have. Um, and I think psychologists indeed have looked into some of this. Babies are obviously born uh, with this inquisitive uh, disposition. Uh, you put something in front of them and they're going to try it out. They're going to taste it, of course. And tasting is the very etymological basis for testing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they crawl around the world. They have to explore it and figure it out. Uh, and, and I think that that's something that we obviously had to do, um, given the kind of environment that we uh, evolved in, to figure out the causal affordances of the world. Um, and this isn't something that's just a, a psychological notion. I think there is an evolutionary reason for a basis for kind of this. You need to have that type of a disposition. Uh, it's going to be selectively advantageous. Uh, in certain types of environments. Um, but but my interest is not in this really uh, as a function of psychology or the personality of scientists. Um, my interest is in this uh, as a philosopher to think of these as character virtues, uh, as normative ideals. Uh, so really, I'm starting with the biological notion, um, but instinct obviously is not enough. Uh, and the idea is to do what I call kind of a normative reconstruction uh, of scientific practice and ask how we ought to behave, how we, how we shape these dispositions uh, in a way uh, that lets us become better knowers. And that's what science is really about. Mm -hmm. How important is curiosity in science? And I mean, does it have to be a specific kind of curiosity or just being curious in general? So in the way that I kind of an, analyze the um, these character virtues for science, I think of curiosity as being a core virtue. It's really a central one for, for science. And other scientific virtues radiate from that, right? So if we're going to really satisfy our curiosity, it's going to require that we be attentive, uh, that we be observant, right, to notice clues about the world. We have to be meticulous, right, in our measurements to make sure that we're accurate and reliable. We have to be skeptical uh, of, of dogma and guard against ourselves and so on. So all of these other virtues kind of revolve around um, what it means to satisfy curiosity and how we ought to behave in order to do that, to do that better. Um, so I think of, cent uh, of curiosity as being very central, um, but again, not just as uh, a psychological trait, uh, that's the disposition that gets us going. Um, what science does is systematize that. So I think of science as being curiosity systematized. Mm -hmm. Is there a set of moral values that orient the production of scientific knowledge? So the reason that I, uh, 
um, I think this is a, a useful way to approach the question, uh, is that it, it helps us link curiosity to uh, the goal of science in the first place, right? When, I mean, curiosity involves wondering why, right? right. And, and I think for science, really the most relevant form of curiosity is this uh, notion of investigating patterns, right? Natural cause effect regularities and so on. And that relates to scientific explanation, right? Which is really what we're after in science, right? It's by investigating the causal structure of the world that science begins to be able to explain things, right? This is what Wesley Salmon talked about in terms of the basic notion of explanation in science and, and why we ask why in the first place, right? So I think that that's the basis of scientific understanding. And from my point of view, um, when we bring in this from a virtue theoretic uh, perspective, that does give us uh, a kind of uh, moral um, uh, framework uh, around which we can understand what's going on, right? We're not uh, producing knowledge in the sense of making it up, right? The whole idea is we want to satisfy our curiosity by figuring out what's really there. Okay? That's the basis of this. Uh, and I think that does have implications for how scientists ought to behave. Uh, so one of the things that, uh, that I've done as a result of this is to think about uh, what responsible conduct of research uh, uh, is. And as you know, um, uh, funding agencies now require that uh, students uh, who are under grants have RCR training. Um, responsible conduct research training. And mostly that's done in terms of compliance issues, right? What are the rules you have to follow for human subjects, animal subjects? I mean, all of this is very important. But but often, you know, scientists think about this as, as being like the ethics police coming from, from outside and, and constraining their research. And I think that from a virtue theoretic point of view, you can think of responsible conduct of research not as something that's externally imposed, but something that flows from the values that make science what it is. And so we've developed really a new form of RCR training that's, that revolves around these virtues uh, and then uh, gets scientists to think about uh, how they lead to uh, behaviors. Um, I'll just give you one example here, right? Um, uh, obviously, one of the central things that are talked about in RCR training is is not to fabricate data, and and usually this is talked about in a uh, in a way to say, look, you're, you're going to get in trouble if you do this. This is going to be the the consequences of doing that. Which, of course, there are consequences of that sort. But the reason not to fabricate data is not because of the consequences of being caught or something of that sort. You don't fabricate data from scientific point of view because that's something that undermines the telos of science, right? Uh, if, if our central goal is to satisfy our curiosity, uh, it's self-contradictory to make something up, right? You want the data to be uh, something that which tells us uh, uh, what the case is. Um, so that helps us reorient this idea of uh, moral values uh, there are things that I think flow not only in a general sense from ethics, but also internally uh, from the very uh, goal of, of scientific practice. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to talk about other virtues like honesty, intellectual humility. But before that, let me just ask you a more general question. Do you think that uh, these traits that lead to the production of good science are inherent to the scientists themselves or they derive mostly from the fact that scientists are integrated into a sort of social milieu where the right incentives are in place and that promotes a particular epistemological approach? Yeah, so obviously it's, it's some, of, some of both. Um, as I've indicated, I think this is um, something that arises from very um, basic internal uh, values um, and really uh, almost logical prerequisites for coming to know about the world, right? When one really needs to do something in this way, if one's going to be successful at finding out true things about the world. Um, so I think there is 
in some sense in which this is inherent. It's partially inherent biologically. It's partially inherent in the nature of the practice. Okay. Um, but of, of course, there are social structures as well and um, relationships among scientists and relationships among scientific institutions to other institutions. Um, and social incentives play a role in that uh, as they do with everything else. So um, what do social incentives do? Uh, well, if you have ones that are aligned with this practice, then they can support it. But if you have ones that are misaligned, they can undermine it. Um, and I think both things happen, right? So it's not a simple matter of, oh, you know, here's, here's how um, society or, or social epistemology makes things work, right? Um, because you can have um, situations that put pressure on these uh, values. Uh, one of the things that I did is, as part of a way to understand this uh, is to do an empirical study where we asked scientists, um, what are the values, the virtues uh, that make for good research, that make for excellence in research? Uh, and we did this as a very systematic uh, national study, uh, uh, working with a, a social science colleague, uh, John Miller. Uh, we interviewed 1,100 scientists uh, and really uh, ask them to describe in detail not only what the virtues are, but sort of how they are exemplified uh, in practice, uh, and also how they came to learn them themselves. Um, and uh, they um, um, discuss this not only in terms of how it helps the practice, but also in terms of how it relates to the academic situation that they're in. Because we, we asked, they said, you know, is this something where um, you I, can identify anything about the current um, uh, structures in academia or, or uh, industry uh, that are relevant to this? And, and many of them would say that, that it's kind of dismaying uh, how current pressures uh, make it harder for scientists to live up to these virtuous ideals. Okay. Um, now, to me, that shows that the incentives may be going the wrong way now, right? They're, the pressure to publish, uh, if, if the only thing one is doing as an incentive to say, how many publications do you have? And, and universities are, are measuring that as a, as a bean counter. That's going to put pressure upon scientists to cut up their research into small pieces and, and perhaps not um, uh, think about it in terms of just the quality of the research, but in terms of the the quantity of it. And that can be something that would undermine uh, quality of research and so on. Um, uh, pressure to get grants, uh, pressure to get funding for this, all of these things could, can make it harder for scientists, especially young scientists, right, to get things going. And many scientists in, in our study sort of said uh, that this was something that was concerning, that the current incentives may be uh, undermining this, which tells us that we ought to perhaps rethink how that incentive structure works. And this is actually one of the things that I think is kind of valuable about this virtue theoretic perspective. It gives us a way to evaluate not just the individual scientist's behavior, right? Are you doing things that are um, in your research conducive or um, counterproductive. But it also lets us, lets us evaluate something about the social structures, right? And to say, how could we improve uh, the incentive structures to better get at what we hope to achieve, namely uh, a better, truer picture of the world. Um, so um, social milieu, milieu can cut both ways. Uh, and this I think can help us uh, perhaps make that a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Talking about honesty, how important is it in science and how is it promoted? <laughs> so, so in our interviews, uh, scientists often brought up how it was that they learned that as a basic value. Okay, I, I, I mentioned uh, it before just in terms of the logic of the structure, right? If, if your goal, your telos, 
is to find out true things uh, about the world, to get truer models uh, of the world, um, being dishonest about what uh, the world is telling you undermines that notion. So that's, that's kind of a, a central uh, thing. But it's not always obvious, especially as you're coming up through the ranks, right, as a student. Um, I think, you know, students always think that they have to uh, write on their exam, you know, what it is that the professor wants to hear, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, which, which uh, yeah, I guess is kind of understandable from that point of view, you know, they're, they're out to get a good grade, so what, what is it they want to know? But, but if you take that attitude into research, certainly into a, you know, research as a graduate student, and you, you say, boy, what is it that my professor is working on, my advisor is working on, what's their hypothesis? And, and am, I, am I giving them the data that is supporting that? that that's inimical to what it is that uh, is really the case. And in these interviews, a number of scientists actually brought up this, this kind of example of how it was that in their training, um, their advisors would say, look, don't tell me what you think I want to hear. Tell me what you're actually finding in your data, right? They're on the lab bench. They're out doing observations and so on. I want to know what it is that you actually find, okay? uh, not just the ones that fit with what you think I want to hear, because what I really want to hear is, what's the case? Uh, and, you know, if you've made a mistake, I mean, many, many people sort of brought this up when they said, look, their advisor would say, look, if you have made a mistake in something, don't try to hide it, right? Uh, I want to know, because that will tell us how we can fix uh, the problem, okay? Um, but if I find that you are dishonest about something like that, that's, that's the end. I don't, I don't want to work with you as a student anymore, right? Because that that undermines what it is that we're really after. So I think that's one way in which honesty is promoted, right? It's in that training where you learn that you're not writing to the test, right? Because we don't know the answer, right? The whole point about this is we have to figure it out. And the only way we can do it is by being honest with ourselves and with what it is that's uh, being shown. The other thing that came up, and this was also pretty interesting, um, and having to do with your question about how it's how honesty is maintained, uh, which is that uh, reputation uh, uh, for honesty is, is crucial as well. So uh, interviewees uh, noted, you know, this doesn't happen that often, but if there's uh, a case where someone is found in the field to have been dishonest in uh, the presentation of their work, um, in the way they report data or, um, you know, in extreme cases where there's been some uh, fabrication of data and so on. They say um, people will no longer uh, want to work with, uh, with them or, or cite their work uh, because it's not trustworthy anymore. Uh, that this idea of uh, honesty as uh, critical to making the project move forward means that uh, if someone is seen to be untrustworthy, not reliable, uh, not honest, uh, that in the end, that's the end of their career, right? No one will want to trust them. They don't think of them as scientists anymore. Uh, and I think that's another way in which honesty is, is maintained uh, internally. It's not, a, of course, a foolproof. Uh, there are dishonest scientists, uh, but this kind of procedure, I think, uh, helps marginalize that and in the end ought to uh, remove it. Mm -hmm. Uh, what is the kind of skepticism that is important for science? Because I would imagine that not all kinds are good or useful. I mean, probably many, there are many science deniers out there that are also, we could also call skeptical, I guess. Yeah, so um, skepticism is one of the traits um, that I think of as uh, in the suite of uh, character virtues as kind of distinctive to science. Mm -hmm. um, Robert Merton actually highlighted that when uh, he was thinking about science, he called it organized skepticism. Um, um, there's certainly something to that. Uh, the way that I um, think of the kinds of skepticism is to really divide them into three general categories. Mm -hmm. um, the first is, is 
uh, what I think of as, as skepticism of dogma, right? Um, if something is presented uh, as, you know, this is just the way it is, something you just have to accept, whether on faith or because someone said so, um, um, that the scientific attitude with regard to that is to say, oh, hold on a second, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, to be skeptical of something that's put forward uh, on the basis of, uh, of authority of that sort. That's just basic to the notion. So always being skeptical of anything that's sort of presented dogmatically, including something that might have been uh, seen as uh, a scientific conclusion that we just now accept, because there's always the inductive possibility that we have to reevaluate that. So even in science, um, we talk in biology about the central dogma, right, in, in, uh, uh, in genetics and so on. But we don't mean that as a dogma, right? We mean that as something that's very well supported. But, you know, if something were to come up in the future that uh, might call that into question, that would be something that a skeptical scientist would have to do. We'd have to, you know, question our assumptions again. So that's the first notion, skepticism of dogma in whatever form. Um, the other thing is sort of skepticism of others, right? Which is to say, uh, you don't uh, just accept something because someone else said so, right? If someone presents something to you, the uh, the idea is uh, that it's always um, something that needs to have an evaluation. Uh, how likely is this, right? Is this something where we should accept it or not? And again, it's it's under the recognition that others can be wrong, right? Even well-intentioned people could be wrong, right? So don't accept it just because even some eminent scientist said so. Uh, uh, it's something where you don't accept it because someone said so, you present it because they're a proxy for the evidence. And in the end, that's all, always something that is open to question. Okay. Now, it doesn't mean that we question everything, right? Um, uh, equally, uh, some things are very well supported and some not so well supported. And part of the goal here from a skeptical attitude is to try to evaluate the degree of confidence that we can have in something. Um, and part of that means, again, uh, recognizing someone you know, as a colleague, as a scientific colleague, who you know to be honest, right? Through the data that they presented, you understand their methods, you know their attitude. Um, so we're not going to be equally skeptical of everyone that flattens things in a way that doesn't allow evaluation. But the skepticism of others means that you don't just accept it uh, at face value. It's always something we have to say, well, we might need to check that. And the third, uh, kind of skepticism is skepticism of self. Uh, and this is probably the most important one uh, because we know uh, that um, uh, we all come uh, with biases and there are things that we hope to be the case. Uh, and we know that we can read in uh, conclusions that we want to see there uh, and that we can fool ourselves. So part of what I think of as really critical to skepticism in science is, is being skeptical of yourself and to put into place guards against reading in what you want to be the case or what you hope to be the case. Um, because what you really want to figure out is what is the case. Right? So all of these different forms, I think, are, are variations on the idea that in science, Conclusions are to be drawn on the basis of evidence, uh, uh, not not authority, and the recognition that it's all too easy to be fooled, uh, including fooling ourselves. So that's uh, what I think of as the, the utility of skepticism, right? It's a kind of attitude that says, check, check it again, uh, uh, check it once more, check yourself, and put into place methods and mechanisms uh, to make it less likely uh, that biases will uh, will come in and infect a conclusion. Mm -hmm. uh, what is intellectual humility and how important is it? So from scientific point of view, uh, this has to do with uh, the idea that you are subservient to what nature is showing you, right? Uh, that you're not imposing something upon nature, uh, 
but rather um, uh, being appropriately uh, humble to the evidence. Uh, and that's the term that uh, I use for this, uh, humility to evidence. It's, it's not that scientists are by nature humble. <laughs> uh, in fact, uh, in our survey, we uh, asked not only what uh, scientific virtues were, but we also asked uh, scientists to, to reflect upon what scientific vices uh, might be. Because of course, uh, from a virtue theoretic point of view, uh, uh, virtue is, uh, you know, a, a balance uh, of, of moderation, right, as Aristotle said it. Uh, and if you get too much uh, or too little uh, vices, uh, uh, it becomes vice rather than a virtue. And it's, it's all too easy uh, when you're focusing on uh, some particular characteristic to accentuate it beyond uh, the level of virtue. <laughs> <laughs> and so we asked uh, scientists, you know, what, what would you say are probably the characteristic vices of scientists? And this is the one that came up by far the most often, which is that scientists can be kind of arrogant. <laughs> and they're, they're saying this about themselves. Yeah. Um, uh, it's, it's probably because of that, you know, this focus on this, that they, they think that they, uh, they're doing it uh, correctly and they'll insist upon it uh, uh, with others. Uh, and, that can get to be too extreme and become become a vice. Uh, so intellectual humility or humility to evidence uh, doesn't mean that scientists don't suffer from these general um, uh, prideful uh, uh, susceptibilities as well. Uh, but the idea is we need to, to work uh, to uh, mitigate that, right? Because the basic notion is uh, that we want to see what nature is showing us and to be humble to what that evidence is. So that's the notion I think that's most relevant, humility to the data. Mm -hmm. Is failure as important as success in science? And I mean, in what ways can uh, scientists take advantage of failure? So I think of this as probably one of the most crucial methodological um, uh, issues that relate to these virtues that I've been talking about. I mean, science is, as I've said, it, it's a history of failure. Uh, it's a history of failed hypotheses. Uh, but that's a good thing. Uh, the, the whole point of it is to put forward something so that you're testing it uh, because you want to check, is it right or not? Uh, that's what scientific tests are all about. Uh, so the notion of um, something gone wrong, right? Your, your experiment disproved, disconfirmed your hypothesis, right? That's a, that's a failure. A lot of scientists put their, their careers on, on the line and, and sort of investigate something, expecting, hoping, checking uh, whether it's so, and it turns out to not be so. Okay, well, uh, you might think, well, that scientist failed, uh, but a scientist recognize, recognizes that that wasn't failure, that that was actually success, okay? Um, that showing something was not the case uh, uh, moves us forward, right? That's, that's we've learned something. Uh, so I think uh, coming to recognize failure as success um, is part of what it means to learn how to do science and to learn how to do it well. Um, this is the part about Popper's work that I think he got exactly right. Obviously he, he was mistaken in, in uh, the way he framed this from a logical point of view and, and in, in rejecting the idea of inductive confirmation and so on. But I think he was exactly right in saying that, that the point about scientific methodology is to put something into a position so it's given a real test. Uh, and testing requires uh, the possibility of failure. If there's no way to fail, then there's no sense of which that was a real test. Uh, so that's uh, the sense of which I think failure is not just as important as success in science, that it in fact helps us understand what success means. Mm -hmm. Is there a scientific method? So, um, it's, it's pretty common in, in science education to talk about scientific method. Uh, and so it's, it's certainly a term that's used in that kind of way. Um, at, uh, at a certain level of analysis, 
um, you'd say, well, it can't just be a method because there are lots of different methods, right? If you're a biologist investigating you know, something at the molecular level, that's going to be different from the methods if you're a social scientist investigating um, human beings, which might be different from someone in in astronomy. So, it, you know, obviously different scientists have different particular methods. But I would say that all of them have the general methodological uh, agreement that what they're doing is finding ways to gather evidence to find out about the world, right? That's, that's the notion of scientific method, to let the evidence uh, be what rules rather than reading in something else. So um, in, in that sense, I think there is sort of a method, but I, I more often speak of this first as not scientific method, but rather the scientific mindset. Mm -hmm. right? It's a way of thinking. Right? And I think this scientific virtue theory provides a framework for how do we evaluate scientific practices, right? So methods are types of practices. And I think this approach helps us evaluate practices, evaluate methods. Okay? Now, the central element of that mindset, this is what I've said before, right, is to draw conclusions of empirical fact, not from authority, but from evidence, right? And the particular methods that we put forward are in the service of that aim, right? This relates to the virtue of objectivity, for example, right? Which, which is meant to push us to seek better ways to avoid biases, right? And how do we do that? How do we implement that? Well, partly we do it through building methods to make it um, so that we're more objective, uh, less likely to be biased. So I'll just give you know some simple examples, right? What was the reason for doing blind experimentation? Well, you're, you're doing that to avoid the danger of your subjects reading in, right? their conscious or unconscious biases for or against some particular outcomes, right? Like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting this drug, so it's, it's, it's helping me, right? If you know that you're getting something, you might um, report um, that you're doing better because you think you are. You're going to read in what you hope to be the case, okay? Well, that's going to undermine finding out what actually is the case. So you blind it so the subjects don't know, okay? That's a way of of mitigating against those biases. We do double blind experiments, right? So that you as an experimenter don't know who's in the experimental group, who's in the control group and so on for the same reason, because we know that we might, right? Read in our biases. And so the idea is you, we set up a method to make it so it's less likely for that to happen. This is a way of, of improving our objectivity. Um, so, I mean, those are just two kinds of examples, but it's not as though we're, we're done with this. Science continues to find ways to improve its methods to that end. I'll, I'll just give two recent examples, right? Because of the, you know, the, the crisis of replicability in social science, there's been a lot of soul searching about it, right? How could we improve our uh, incentive structures and uh, institutional methods, peer review, and so on, to make it less likely to have these sorts of problems. And, you know, one thing that's now coming to the fore is this idea of, of pre-registration, where you, uh, in advance, state, uh, here's what we're hypothesizing, right? Um, here's what uh, we're uh, predicting to happen, rather than sort of gathering data and then after the fact, uh, reading in, uh, pulling out some uh, some hypothesis from that, this idea of, of harking, right? Hypothesizing after the results are known, right? Pre-registration is now a method to put in place that might make it less likely that scientists uh, do it backwards, that harking would be less likely. Uh, another new thing is, is the even stronger notion of registered reports, where you, uh, certain journals are now having procedures where you have peer review at the point of the proposal. You say, here's the study we're going to do, and you have peer reviewers evaluate the methods and so on. And the journals uh, will guarantee that they will publish the results no matter which way it comes out, okay? And what that does is get the focus on the methodology to make sure that we're going to get something that tells us something. And then it, it 
avoids the issue that typically is the case before, which is that negative results don't get published. Right? Journals would, would only publish positive results. And so you have a, a publication bias against negative results. So register reports is a way of mitigating against that type of bias and again, making journals more objective. So these are methods, right, that we keep improving, I would say, to better uh, fulfill what it is that we're after, which is, you know, finding out true things through better or objective methods. So. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's any way of definitely solving the demarcation problem that is, for example, coming up with a definite set of criteria to distinguish between science and pseudoscience? So the way that the, when people talk about the demarcation problem, uh, this really comes from the way that Karl Popper framed it. He was the one who posed it uh, with that language. Um, and, and, you know, the, the, the way in which he was thinking about this was in relationship to some particular um, um, cases that he was familiar with that he thought of as not truly being science. I mean, he was particularly thinking of, of, of Marxism, which was put forward as a scientific form of history uh, or um, Freudian psychology, which was put forward as, you know, scientific. And his, his concern was that these actually were not really scientific, uh, that they were uh, making claims about, uh, in one case, broad social structures and economic change and the other um, uh, hypotheses about, about uh, human beings and their, their motivations in relationship to their parents and, and this and that. And he said, but really the way this is done, uh, they're just creating stories and that there's nothing that one would see that would uh, lead them to, um, to reject it. And, and he thought of those as being cases that kind of looked like science, but really, uh, really weren't. And um, obviously, you know, his particular solution was to say it, it really had to do just with this idea of falsification, right? If you could uh, not falsify a hypothesis, then that was to be pseudoscience. Now, um, Popper obviously was uh, was too simple in the way that he thought about this. And I think even the way that he framed the question was too simple. It's not going to be something where you can say, here's a list of necessary and sufficient conditions that, that cleanly distinguish science from, from, from all other things. I think that's, that's, that's implausible. Um, I mean, demarcation of concepts uh, is perennial as an issue for philosophers. I mean, that's what we do, right? We like to, to take something and to say, well, there's this form and that form, and you have sub varieties of this and you, you uh, draw a distinction. I mean, you can always sell a philosopher a distinction typically uh, because we, we like to, uh, uh, to sort of be, be precise and subtle. That's, that's part of what we're after. Uh, so you'd think that the idea of demarcation would be something that would be, um, the, part of the bread and butter of scientists, uh, philosophers, and, and so on. Uh, but philosophers also like to problematize concepts, right? Where they like to fuzzy up boundaries and sort of think, well, you thought these were different, but really they're the same. And, so on. and I think both of those issues have come into play in this demarcation problem, um, uh, in part just because of the way it was it was framed. So if you pose it in that way, then I don't think there is sort of a definitive way of solving it. Uh, rather, you have to think of it more, more precisely. Demarcating science from what, right? It's not just from everything else. Um, it really does have to do with um, saying, is it different from this, okay? And I think one could legitimately pose the problem for any particular science, right? Is Freudian psychology, right? Um, truly done in a scientific way? Well, I think it certainly could be, right? Uh, but it's also correct that one could uh, be reading in things without really testing them. In that case, Freudian psychologists would need to be more self-critical and say, okay, we're not really doing science if we're not doing it doing it well in that kind of way. So I think that's that's right. Um, uh, another uh, distinction, of course, is, is, is demarcating science from other types of practices and so on. Um, social practices of different sorts. Um, is science different from religion? Well, yeah, I think it is. Uh, 
And that's something where I think in particular cases you can be uh, precise about why it is that this is a religious point of view rather than a scientific uh, point of view. So uh, that just requires looking very carefully at what's being claimed uh, and how the methods and values that, that are being used uh, fit or don't fit uh, with, uh, with science. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the virtues we've talked about that characterize or should characterize scientists are, are also present in pseudoscientists or not? Or perhaps they are, but they express themselves in a way that lead them to produce bad science or something that resembles science, but it's not really science. Yeah, so this does relate to your previous question, obviously. So I don't typically talk about things in terms of pseudoscience, but but uh, really in terms of, of uh, kind of counterfeit science, right? The idea of pseudo really is the idea that something is a fake. Uh, it bears a, a surface resemblance uh, to something, but it misses the substance. Um, and there, there are obviously many ways that one could fake uh, scientific practice. Uh, but I think the key thing here is that if you're a, if you're a counterfeiter, uh, the thing that you're doing is that you're starting with the conclusion uh, that you want and, and making it so that it, it appears that something supports that. That's, I think that's the key thing that, that makes something pseudoscientific uh, and so on. Um, I mean, in the classic case for creationism, right, they assume that they know the answer already um, by the authority of, of scripture, by the authority of God, right? That's, that's uh, in my view, sort of an archetypical example of an appeal to authority, okay? Uh, and because they already think they know the answer, everything else they, they do uh, is um, to try to support that. So they, they essentially work backwards, right? Uh, it might superficially look like there's evidence being presented, uh, but it's always perverted in the service of their foregone conclusion, right? And, and basically, you know, in the most cynical of cases, what they want is sort of the value of scientific currency, uh, but they don't earn it, right? They're mm -hmm. assuming what it is that needs to be proven, what needs to be tested and supported. Now, I, I don't think this is always done in bad faith. Um, Sometimes you have um, folks who do this based upon a sincere belief, uh, and really what's going on is almost a you know a very severe form of confirmation bias, right? They think they know the answer, and so they're just reading things in of, of that sort. Uh, and that's an example of, of fooling ourselves, of course, where skepticism needs to come in uh, to do that. Um, you know, we're all human beings. Uh, we all have, I think, this innate uh, desire to kind of figure out the world. Uh, and if something's really mysterious, you know, it's it's really pretty easy to sort of say, well, there must be some designer uh, uh, who, who does this, some supernatural being. And of course, you know, that's an easy explanation for everything, right? <laughs> but there, no matter what puzzle you have, you say, well, God did it, God did it. So supernatural by itself is, a, you know, a, an all, it's a, a ready explanation for anything, right? So one size fits all, which of course means that it, it's not a true explanation because there's nothing that it doesn't explain, which gets back to the idea of testing, right? There does, there's nothing that functions there as a test of it. Um, so that's something that I think you can rule out pretty easily. Uh, but the more general question you have, uh, I think, is, is related to this idea of our natural tendency to want to read in what we hope to be the case. And that what science is there is a check to say, no, Let's not fool ourselves. Our goal is to find out what's really the case, and that requires that we really implement these methods uh, uh, in a way and, and uh, try to keep our, our hopes and our expectations in check and not read in uh, a conclusion uh, uh, into the evidence, but rather let the evidence lead us to our conclusion. Mm -hmm. Is there any relationship between science and ethics? So the thing that I've been trying to, to suggest here is that there's a notion of ethics that's part of science itself. Mm -hmm. That really, if you understand science, you should recognize it as having a normative structure, right? The telos of science provides uh, uh, a guiding purpose. 
And then the virtues are traits that scientists ought to develop uh, if they're going to do that well, right? If you're looking to do something with excellence and so on. So in that sense, it does provide a form of ethics, right? It's, 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 uh, it's something that says we ought to do this if we're going to be better, right? It's pushing us in that kind of way. So that's one form that I think is, is, uh, uh, is pretty straightforward. Uh, the other thing uh, that I think is a connection between science and ethics uh, is based upon this idea that uh, if you ought to do something, um, that presumes that you can do it. Okay? This idea of ought implies can. And I think that one of the things that science can do is help us study the mental attributes that make it possible for us to be moral actors in the first place. Okay? What is it that we have that lets us evaluate and make moral choices? Uh, which again is this idea of how it is that you get there. I don't think that this just arises <laughs> full blown from the head of Zeus. Again, right? this is something we have to give a story of and investigate what the components would be that would allow that to happen. And actually Darwin himself uh, uh, wrote about this. Uh, part of his work in The Descent of Man was to ask, right, you know, here's this thing that seems to be distinctively human, right, our moral sense. How is it that we could have gotten something like that? And he thinks about how it could be that an evolutionary process could gradually produce the components that allow us to become moral actors. Uh, and he, he thinks through how this might relate to really what were the, uh, the best philosophical, ethical views of his day. He thinks of it in relationship to uh, utilitarian principles. He thinks of this in relationship to the golden rule. Uh, and he gives an account of how it is that you could have an instinct of virtue, right? Uh, what he called the, really the moral sense. And he, and he offers, a, you know, essentially a hypothesis about or a model of how it could be that evolution could produce uh, such a thing. Um, again, this is something where we're now in a position to investigate this from uh, an empirical point of view. And uh, you had mentioned uh, some of my work on that, where we could use these digital models to essentially uh, test uh, an evolutionary um, uh, model of how um, you can have selection for uh, altruistic behavior. Uh, and, and we could actually watch as these digital organisms did just that, where they would evolve uh, so that they would contribute resources and so on. And, and uh, this fits with uh, uh, an evolutionary perspective. Not that that by itself is the end of the story, because it, this is something that has uh, a normative notion, but it shows how it is that evolution uh, can produce essentially the wherewithal to make this possible. Uh, the other thing that it does, I would say, <laughs> uh, is that it, it, it uh, makes it so that uh, we can show the limits of our moral uh, reasoning, right? Again, odd implies can. What is it that we can do, right? This, this uh, that I've mentioned before was sort of showing the steps that bring us up to the threshold of being able to do it. But it also shows that at this point we still have and may forever in the future have limits on our ability to think morally. Uh, I'll just kind of give a, you know, an extreme example of that, right? We have just limited computational power in our brains, right? There's only so many, <laughs> so many calculations that we can do. Uh, so if you thought, for example, like if you were an extreme uh, utilitarian, you thought that, that uh, morality depended upon making a choice, uh, that calculated uh, the uh, the overall maximization of utility uh, in any particular uh, uh, ethical choice, uh, the bounded rationality of human beings would seem to suggest that we will never be moral agents because we'll never be in a position uh, to calculate those sorts of uh, of effects. Right? What's the the uh, the proportion of uh, happiness versus unhappiness of pleasure versus pain that's going to result from this action compared to that action. So we just we just can't do it from a mere limitation of computational power. So if you thought that that was the case, you'd have to say, well, that tells us something about 
utilitarianism. It's, it's too high a standard for us. Uh, we're not going to be able to be that type of moral agent. So I think this is useful. Uh, uh, we can actually make use of something about what we would learn from science uh, to say something about the kinds of moral beings that we can be. Uh, it suggests that we ought to be a little humbler <laughs> about our moral capacities uh, and maybe a little more forgiving uh, of our moral failings. Mm -hmm. but, but do you think that science makes us or can make us better people? So I, I think it can. Uh, I, I usually like to, to quote um, Fanny Wright, uh, who is a 19th century social reformer, uh, philosopher. She was actually a student of Jeremy Bentham. Um, she uh, was an early feminist, early free thinker, uh, abolitionist, and so on, uh, and, and truly spent her work trying to improve social conditions and fight for social justice in various ways. And she credited uh, uh, the scientific mindset as the basis for that. Right? She says the sciences, you know, have ever been uh, the surest guides to virtue. <laughs> uh, and and she, she talks about this in terms of, of what science provides us when done well, right, with this idea of, of calm observation and, and dispassionate investigation and, and the cultivation of judgment. So it's not just that we uh, think what we want to think, but we let um, nature and observations and their effects uh, guide us, right? So that we, can, we don't just uh, um, read things in, but our judgment is honed in this type of way. Um, I mean, she, she thought that part of what we ought to do is, is build in a scientific education uh, as a way to improve society. Uh, she thought of that as a way to go. Now, uh, I think she maybe was a little optimistic about what science could do. It's, I don't think science can, by itself can do that, um, but I think it, it, it can help. Um, um, my, uh, my view is, is that, that part of what it is to be a better person is, um, is to actualize what it is to be human beings. I mean, this is the general idea of human flourishing. I mean, Aristotle says, this is what eudaimonia is. It's the actualization of our, of our potential as human beings. Uh, and in that sense, uh, making us better people is making it so that we're better actualizing these virtues, becoming more excellent as such. Uh, and even though I focus on you know, the scientific virtues or other vocational virtues, um, the idea of a vocational virtue is to think of the telos of a particular uh, of a particular vocation. And, and I use the term vocation rather than profession or discipline, because I think this does have this, this moral notion. It's a calling. It's something that, that is for this, this uh, uh, ideal purpose and so on. Uh, uh, that uh, uh, is something that I think uh, we are now able to, to investigate. And for science, part of what that does is that it helps us actualize that part of us right? This instinctual notion of being curious, right? The satisfaction of curiosity, making empirical discoveries, it's not just an instrumental good, right? I think it actually is constitutive in part of human flourishing. We are beings who want to know, right? We want to find out. Um, so I, I think that that's a sense in which it makes us better people because it helps us accentuate that. Now, I don't mean to say that science is the only thing, right? The idea of vocational virtue is to say different vocations uh, have different uh, things that they uh, aim for and um, accentuate different virtues that help us do that. Uh, I, I describe this as kind of the division of moral labor, right? Again, we can't do everything uh, ourselves, but um, we, have to, we have to specialize in a way. And what scientists do is specialize in this one uh, uh, part of it. Uh, uh, others uh, in other vocations, whether you're an artist or a physician, a healer or whatever, they have other things that they focus on. Uh, and the idea in the end would be to integrate these things. Integrity, I think, as a, as a whole uh, requires that we bring these uh, together. Um, and, and all of that is in the, in, the, uh, in the goal of human flourishing overall. And I think that does uh, make us better people, not science by itself, uh, but science uh, in collaboration with uh, with these others. Mm -hmm.
So just one last question. Would you say that science is a cultural construct? And what would that mean exactly? So it's certainly a cultural practice. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it has a coherent set of normative practices that constitute a cultural identity. I actually think that scientists have as strong a sense of shared identity as, you know, members of, you know, any, um, um, any nation or, or, or a particular group. In, in some sense, I think that's, that's probably more important, right? If, if you've really been called to this vocation, right? That's much more of, of what makes you who you are than, you know, where you were born or, or, or uh, things of that sort. Um, so it's obviously cultural in, in that kind of sense. Uh, we are social beings and, and of course we're part of culture. And, and, uh, calling it a construct, however, could sort of be a little misleading, right? It's a cultural construct. Um, there's a simple sense of that in which you'd say, well, of course it's a construct because you know it's part of how we um, put things together, right? We're constructing uh, the edifice of knowledge by rigorous testing, right? And so we're, in, in that very simple sense is right. But sometimes, construct is contrasted. If you think of it in an extreme way, it's contrasted uh, with discovering, right? You, you, you construct as opposed to discover. And if you think of these as being um, opposite, um, then I think it's problematic that science is not something of that sort, because this idea of extreme notion of construct is that knowledge is created, right, as opposed to discovered. Um, and in, on some analyses, it's just created by who happens to be in power, right? So it's just a, it's just a knowledge as a function of, of, of uh, the power of those who are elite and, and so on. Or if you're religious, you might say it's a function of those who, uh, uh, you know, who hold this particular faith and so on. So that's a, a form, it's a, it's a different kind of form of creationism, but if you think of, of, of uh, creation in that sense, a construct in that sense, then I think it needs to be rejected, right? It's it's uh, similarly an appeal to just authority as opposed to evidence. Um, I think it's kind of similar to the circles that we get into with the nature-nurture debate where you get people who say, well, it's all nature or it's all nurture and so on as though this is a forced choice. And obviously there's, there's some of each. Uh, and if we're careful, what we ought to do is try to tease that apart uh, and and show the elements of each. Uh, so I certainly don't think that we're just making this up. Uh, the whole idea of science is to try to figure out what's really the case. And if there are cases where we're creating it, constructing it rather than discovering it, that's a failure that we need to try to correct uh, because our goal is uh, to figure this out uh, uh, and let nature say it. I, I actually think that there's, uh, uh, sort of an, an extreme case, right? Where if you're reductionist on the one side, uh, you think science is the is the only way to view things. Uh, this is scientism, right? It, it's hegemonic, it takes over everything. And obviously that's to be resisted. But I think you have a kind of hegemony on the other side as well, uh, where you say, well, everything is just a narrative. Uh, and I, I, I sort of think of this as narrativism, right? Uh, and you reduce things to everything just being in a story with all stories being equivalent. Um, I think that's equally problematic. Uh, so really uh, our goal ought to be to find a way to recognize what it is that science can do for us, right? Mm -hmm. Finding out better, truer uh, pictures of the world uh, and also understand what uh, literature gives us what philosophy gives us uh, in terms of an appreciation of values and what gives meaning uh, and that these things have to come together. Uh, uh, so that's another sense in which we can't do it by ourselves. Uh, uh, we've got to do this collaboratively. Yeah. So the book is again an instinct for truth, curiosity and the moral character of science. I will be leaving a link to it in the description box of this interview. And Dr. Panek, just before we go, would you like to mention any places on the internet where people can find you or your work? Uh, uh, Michigan State just recently deprecated its its uh, its old uh, infrastructure for its internet, so I've had to start to recently recreate my my faculty pages and so on. But if you do a search there, you'll find me, and slowly I'll be putting my uh, information back up there uh, with uh, with uh, references to. Uh, 
publications and the projects that I'm doing and so on. So I think that'll be the best place. Okay, so thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you, Ricardo. I appreciate it. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like, hit the subscription button, all of those things you already know. And please consider supporting the show either on PayPal or Patreon. All of the links will be in the description box of the interview starting at $1 per month. So it would be a great help. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters. Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perga Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunder, Ricardo Vladimir, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbord, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Ginty, Zurtger Vosbo, Weingard, Rebecca Neuberger, Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Narcio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Colombo, George Pinha, Phil Kavanagh, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Dugny, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Kassan, Ivan Bodrenko, Al Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Oslem Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W. João Weira, Tom Hamel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dremiti Grigoriev, Diego Lanonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punta, Radana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmidi, Saima Fzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortes, Ursula Litzke, Denise Cook, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy and Trader in NYC. My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafiniak, Ian Gilligan, Luis Caetano, Tom Vangnagdam, Curtis Dixon, John Linares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Giddy, Sardos France, Thomas Trumbull and Nuno Welder. And my executive producers, Michel Rogieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codriano and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.